Well, welcome to the bridge. We're so glad that you're here. Would you please stand? We're going to clap our hands like this. Come on. Our God does great things. Let's sing about it. Here we go. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. Yes, He has. And see what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Yeah, He has done great things. We sing. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. Desire 
is now satisfied hearing your love. It's nothing, come on. Oh, there's nothing hey, better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing. Psalm 34, Psalm 34, we want to read it out loud. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless, that's you and me, take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. That's what we're doing in this space right now. And that's why we invite you to sing every single week. Let's continue to sing. In the dark, we were waiting without hope and without light. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill. Virgin came the word from a 
that stone was moved for good For the land that conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born such a powerful song and the verse that resonates with me the most is that knowing that this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died that Jesus gave everything that he had so that you and I could have a relationship with God and now he gives us the ability the responsibility to tell everybody around us about what he's done in our lives and that's exactly what we're going to be praying for today this week, we're gonna be praying for our gospel outreach. Now for a moment, think about the people that you interact with on a daily basis. So like your friends, your family, your coworkers, the people at the grocery store. God gives us so many opportunities to share the gospel. So I pray that we would be intentional, that we would be bold, that we would share the gospel. We would invite people to church so that their lives can ultimately be transformed just like ours has been. So I invite you right now, to individually and silently pray. We'll have some prompts on the screen behind me, and then I'll close us in prayer. This time is between you and God. Heavenly Father, we praise you for sending your son who lived the perfect life that we could never live, that died the death that we deserve to die. And we praise you for our salvation, that you have saved us from hell, that you've given us a purpose here on earth. We ask that you would take away the fear, the excuses, but we would bro broadly complain that we would show everybody, Lord, that you've changed our lives that we would do in a way where there would be no fear, but we would be living for you. We love you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can take a seat. We have an incredible story to share with you. So it's February, 2022. Um, we were pregnant with our third child. We get the diagnosis that he has hypoplastic left heart syndrome, which is known as HLHS. It's very severe disease that cannot be fixed. There are three what they call palliation surgeries and then eventually he would need a heart transplant. I would have echoes for Isaiah what was it every four weeks and that's when every echo started getting worse and worse. Um, they found this thing that started to make his lungs at risk. With bad lungs you can't get a heart transplant. Throughout the process it, it continued to come up you guys really ought to uh, try out going to Michigan. Uh, For a surgeon. I was, what, already 32 weeks pregnant. We meet with the surgeon, and she tells us it's the worst heart she's ever seen. We should probably just go back to Chicago and have hospice care. 
um, our chances had already went from like 80s to 30s to now zero. Went back to our hotel room. We, we cried a lot, we prayed a lot, um, and we were kind of just bracing for our trip back to Chicago to where we were going to be giving birth to a, a, a child who was going to suffocate in his mom's arms uh, shortly after birth. Sitting in that hotel room, May 25th, I think this is kind of when we just fully surrendered to Jesus and we were praying through it all, but so I wrote, they say there is no hope for your life. Never did I expect this. I am devastated, but the doctors are not who our hope should be in. Our only hope, only way is the Lord, as it always should have been. I am mourning you already, but I try not to go there, as there will only be rejoicing in heaven, still praying for a miracle, but trying to accept that may not be God's plan. The following morning, I had an MRI with him, um, and they said if his lungs are not completely shot, there might be a very small chance that we could try. We'll just try um, the surgery. So we go back, we make a plan. We're gonna go back to Michigan, 37 weeks pregnant, C-section delivery. He needs surgery within less than an hour of birth. June 21st, 2022, probably one of the scariest days of my life. Isaiah was born. Uh, his stats were a little bit better than they were. His oxygen saturations. For. Uh, he <laughs> went in. He had a, a hybrid surgery. Uh, it was a successful surgery. I feel like sometimes when we reflect, it seems like he did well. But the next three weeks was in and out of death. Like he was dying one day, he was okay the other day. This is when you really learn that your kids are not your own, that God has a greater purpose. And even if you walk away without a baby, that he will use us. July 14th, he was extubated. His biopsy showed, of his lungs showed horrible things. Everything showed horrible things. We make it to September. We have a, by our first bypass surgery. And then he just started doing okay. We eventually did have the second palliative surgery. And that's kind of when we started to find the bridge. Yeah. I was on a phone call with a friend from college. She invited us to her small group. We love it. And we start going to the bridge Randhurst. Uh, we find out that they're opening a new bridge, Bridge North Shore. Uh, we're serving there basically every week now. My mom always said, Paige, God will restore. God will restore your family. Um, and I think we just are really grateful for the bridge. Isaiah's life is still really uncertain. He still has one more palliative surgery, but right now he's 20 months old. He's doing fantastic. Truly thriving. For anybody going through a trial, um, I would say you just gotta dive into your word because that's where true peace resides. He truly is the rock in all, in all the hardships. Isaiah is the best thing that's happened to us. And I, I, I wouldn't trade the experience for anything in the world. And not I, because he's a miracle, not because he's just living. It's because of how much closer our family is, how much closer Paige is, how much closer I am to the Lord. I'm Kevin. I'm Paige. And we are followers, followers of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. I love watching that video and it's amazing that even though they're still in the midst of it, like they're not out of the woods yet, they're so thankful that that happened because they know that God has brought them together closer as a family. And that's truly something that only God can do. Well, welcome to the bridge. This is your first time. We're so glad that you're here. Our mission is to connect people with God, with people, and with service. And we hope that happens for you. We'd love to connect with you. And the best way to do this is by filling out our online connect card. So you can scan the QR code that's in your bulletin. You can use the bridge app on your phone. And if you're watching online, click connect. Now, this is super important that everybody does this. So if this is your first time, we would love your name, your number, along with any information that you're comfortable sharing. If you're a regular, you can put down your name, as well as any information that's changed. There'll be some boxes for you to check off, as well as a spot for prayer requests. And please use this, because we'd love to be praying for you. Now, through this code, there's also a way to give. But if this is your first time, please don't feel obligated to give. This is really for those who call the bridge their home. We'll have some offering buckets on the way out as well. Well, we have a lot going on in our church. Here's what's coming up at the bridge. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Maddie, and here's what's happening at The Bridge. Are you new to The Bridge? If you answered yes, then Bridge 101 is for you. This two-week class is your next step to find out more about who we are and where we're going as a church. Our next class begins April 21st and 28th. Sign up on our website. Easter weekend is coming soon. It's an incredible opportunity to invite friends and family to hear about the hope of the world through a clear gospel message. The weekend begins with Good Friday. Death had to come before the resurrection, so we shouldn't skip to Easter without first remembering Good Friday. Then we wrap up our weekend with a party celebrating the resurrection. There are plenty of service times to choose from. Pick your time, mark your calendar, and invite someone to join you. Check out your bulletin or visit our Easter webpage. That's it for today. Please grab your phone right now and put it on silent. If you need to take it out of your purse or pocket, go for it. It really helps us create an amazing atmosphere. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of the service. If I were to take a little field trip of my regrets, I'd probably want to leave the stage right now. Breaking and entering a historic log cabin, vandalizing a school uh, during the summer holidays, stealing my uncle's cigarettes out of his tractor, plus a whole lot more. These are all part of my inglorious past. And I know you thought I was one of those righteous and perfect preachers, but now you know the truth. And every time that I return to Canada where I grew up, and uh, which incidentally happens again this week, I'm going up there on a business trip, but I, I experience these regrets as I drive past those old places. Does that remind you of, of anything that you're trying to avoid if you go past a place of something that brings up a regret? Driving by and you have all these bad memories and feelings of regret. We've all got them, don't we? Taking a field trip of our regrets, we pass by those places that bring back shame and terrible memories. Well, today we're going to look at a guy that has far deeper regrets than any of us have ever had, and we're going to see how his story can actually bring healing to our story. Acts chapter 9, 1 to 25. If you got your pew Bible, it's page 917. Let's pray before we jump into the text. Father, this day we look at your word again, and we look at a story of someone who had a lot of reason for regret, and yet you took and, and, and transformed and redeemed, and a incredible conversion story that we see tonight of a man that was gloriously changed. Father, we pray that you would engage our hearts and our minds and, and change us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture today uh, focuses on a young terrorist by the name of Saul, a man who supervised the murder of Stephen. We talked about this in the past. He was the first Christian martyr. And now this man, Saul, turns his frustration and his anger toward this entire group of people that, like Stephen, believed in Jesus. Verse 1, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. It's interesting language here, breathing threats and murder. And perhaps you've heard this statement before. It's attributed to uh, Tertullian, an early church father, who said, The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. I want you to think just a moment about Saul's frustration. Why is he so frustrated? I mean, he killed Stephen, and now he's putting men and women in prison. He's arguing, threatening, torturing them. But the church is still growing, it's expanding. See, the blood of the martyrs was becoming the seed of the church. And he was not able to, to, to suppress this. Christianity was growing and spreading. For, first north to Samaria, and then south all the way to Ethiopia. And so his frustration is mounting. His hatred is intensifying. He's breathing out threats of violence. And the picture we have here is of Saul seething with anger. Saul went to the high priest, the scripture says, and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. 
Saul goes to the high priest and like a bounty hunter, he's getting permission to pursue these Christians who are following the way, another name for Christianity. And he goes all the way to Damascus on foot, 150 miles from Jerusalem. He wants to hunt down men, women, children, grandmas, grandpas, and drag them off to prison. Can you just picture that for a moment? Shackled at the wrist, shackled at the ankles, dragging them back to Jerusalem. This is who Saul was. He was a terrorist hell-bent on destroying Christianity. And here's your spoiler alert for tonight's message. That's who he was, not who he is, who he was. Today, we're gonna hear a crazy conversion story. And then we're gonna see how in the rest of the book of Acts, he's spreading the message of Jesus wherever he goes. Now, I'm sorry if I ruined that uh, story for you. I'm kind of good at doing spoiler alerts, uh, giving away the endings of movies. That's just who I am. But let's take a look at at some of his origins. Let's meet Saul and uh, find out who he was. There were these apocryphal writings that early Christians um, didn't really include in in what they thought was inspired, but there were writings out there. And in those writings, Christians describe uh, Saul's appearance. Could be true, could be not, but here goes. And this is how they depicted him. A man of low stature, bald on the head, crooked thighs, whatever that looks like, eyebrows meeting, it means he had a unibrow, and uh, a long crooked nose, maybe a bit of a George Costanza vibe, I don't know. But true or not, we don't really know, but what we do know, the scripture does describe Saul as a young man, and he was probably about under 40 is, is what we think, and we know that he was definitely a very privileged person. Born in Tarsus, he was raised in a Jewish home. In fact, he had dual citizenship, and that led to immense privilege for him. Saul was his Jewish name. Paul, as we know him in the rest of the New Testament, was his Greek name. And having dual citizenship meant that he could travel anywhere he wanted in the the Roman Empire. It gave him legal protection. It was a privilege that many people didn't have. Saul was also very brilliant, and he was also a very religious Jewish man. He was a he had studied as a, as a Pharisee under a, a, a famous rabbi named Gamaliel. And I need you to understand here, folks, that uh, Saul, in order to become a Pharisee, it meant that he had to memorize what we call today the entire Old Testament. In other words, he was advanced in Judaism beyond many of his own age. He was top of his class, valedictorian. This guy was one smart cookie. It might also be important for you to know that Saul was single. We don't know if he had been widowed. He may have never married, but we do know that by the time we meet him in the book of Acts, that he is single. And that means he had a lot of time on his hands trying to stomp out this new Christian cult, the way as it was known. Saul was also very resilient. And uh, I mean, you've got a guy who oversaw Stephen's murder and then he's like, let's go get some more. In essence, his motto was, let's find every Christian in town. Let's drag him off to prison. And oh, since Christianity is spreading everywhere, let's make a comprehensive plan. Let's get together a group of commandos. Let's walk 150 miles if we have to to declare war on Christianity. This is Saul, a young, single, brilliant, privileged, religious, and exasperated man who's got papers in hand to go lock up some more Christians. Let's get back to our text. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him And falling to the ground, he heard a voice. Now, two quick observations before we go on. First, from Jerusalem to Damascus is, uh, as I pointed out, 150 miles. This would be like a six-day journey for him. It's not a simple simple undertaking that he's doing here, folks. And then secondly, this light from heaven. I want you to picture a a, a lightning bolt, a lightning flash. Now, if you were Jesus and, and you were coming in contact with this guy that's known for killing your people dragging all your saints off to prison and chaining him up. The number one enemy of the cross, you could say, if you were Jesus, what would you say? What would you do to this guy? Well, I know what I would do. And I know what I would say. I would say, prepare to die, Saul, (laughs) and then zap. And I would fry him into a, you know, strip of bacon with a lightning bolt. That's what I would do. I mean, the amount of pain that this guy had caused. Widows are weeping because of him. Kids are orphans because of this guy. And families have left town because of him. And yet, we need to notice in the text how gracious God is to Saul. Verses four to five. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He didn't fry him into a strip of bacon. He said, who are you, Lord? 
And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, now wait a second. Jesus is in heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. And, and, and the text is saying, why are you persecuting me? Saul's not out marching to persecute Jesus. He's not marching out to murder Jesus. Jesus is in heaven. So why is Jesus saying to Saul, Saul, you are persecuting me. What's going on here? Well, it's because Jesus loves his church so much that he considers an attack on his people, on his church, an attack on him. Jesus, you see, does not see the church as an it or a building. He sees the church as you and me. That's the church. And Jesus has united himself to us in such a powerful way that he says we are one, just like a bride and groom become one. That's the picture of Jesus in the church. In fact, you can't love Jesus without loving his bride and being committed to her. That would be like you telling me, hey, Luke, I like you, man. <laughs> love your vibe. You're tall, cool. Well, maybe not tall and good looking. But your wife, Amy, she's a skank and a jerk. Oh, man, if you said that, <laughs> me and a couple guys from church who are barely saved, we'd be coming over to your place to talk. Because you can't separate a love for me from a love for my wife, Amy. We are one. And in a similar way, Jesus is one with his church. Now, unfortunately, we see a lot of this today. People say, oh, I, I love Jesus, but I don't want to get involved with the local church. Or they'll tear down the local church. They'll criticize the bride of Christ. Well, according to the Bible, that's the same as you saying, I don't want to get too involved with Jesus because Jesus clearly identifies himself with the church. It's why he says, when you feed and clothe the poor, or you serve a brother or a sister, you are doing it for him. So in the text, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Verses six to eight. But rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground. And although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and they brought him into Damascus. Here we see mighty Saul kneeling before God from religious zealot to completely undone. Once he saw clearly, now he is being led by the hand, completely blind. Saul, who was seized others at one time, is now being seized by God. Verse nine, and for three days he was without sight and he neither ate nor drank. Saul's in great shock. He can neither eat nor drink. He's just trying to make sense of it all. Verses 10 to 12. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Now, I just want you to imagine for a moment if we were back in maybe 2002 and uh, God came to you and said, hey, I've got a mission for you. I've got a mission for you. You say, all right, Lord, absolutely. What do you want me to do, God? He says, well, I want you to go to a Walmart after church. You know, the one that's on the corner of Milwaukee and Gulf. And uh, there's this guy there that I've blinded. I want you to put your hands on him and pray that he'll receive the Holy Spirit. You might say, well, that's a little weird, God, but okay, if you say so. By the way, what's his name, God? Osama bin Laden. Whoa, no way, God. And yeah, I know, that's a little, little uh, extreme, Luke. I, I, it's probably what some of you are thinking about now. But no, Saul was a crazy man terrorist known by the church as a terrorist, known by Ananias as a terrorist. He would have been an Osama bin Laden back in the day. Saul would have been shocking to you and I. And so Ananias pushes back, verse 13. Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. Ananias is rightfully questioning and essentially says to God, why this guy? And God responds, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Translated, what God is saying here is I'm gonna pick out the most hostile person to the faith, the one with the most regrets in life, the one who is the farthest away from me to show the world that if I can save this guy, I can save anyone. 
And so Ananias obeys God. He goes to where Saul is staying and he puts his hands on him. And he says, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. And then he rose and was baptized. And the rest is history, as they say. Saul goes on to become one of the greatest missionaries the world has ever known. And this is his origin story. It's his story of conversion, if you will. Now, I know that for some of us, this word conversion may seem like a kind of an outdated, outmoded term, a little strange. But Christian conversion is the most profound change that can take place in a human being. Many of you have experienced that. There's really no other way to describe what happens when you and I became Christians. Basically, you're converting or you're changing from what you were to something new. That's what conversion is. And you know, sometimes people think that they are Christians, but they've never really converted. I want you to listen carefully, folks, to this. People will say things like, well, here's the thing, Luke. I've always been a Christian. My parents baptized me as a kid. I grew up in a Christian home, and so I've just always been a Christian. It's almost like me saying to you, you know, I've, I, I've always been married, <laughs> always been married. No, there was a very specific time that I remember when Amy and I got acquainted close to 30 years ago, and I converted from singlehood to marriage. I became one with her, and I left my old world of singlehood before, behind. And there was also a time when I entered into a relationship with my creator. It was a conscious decision on my part to convert from the old to the new. And you know, for some people, it's as dramatic as Saul's story. We've got some super cool stories here at the bridge, don't we? Really cool stories of how people had these crazy encounters with God and were completely changed. There's this one guy from the bridge. Uh, he's now in one of our small groups and his story is crazy. He had no religious background. He's just working out at the gym one day and lifting weights. And all of a sudden he hears this voice that says, why don't you just give me a chance? Just give me a chance. And so he does. And he begins to Google churches in our area, came to the bridge that way, gave his life to God, and now he and his wife are baptized and in a small group. Crazy, amazing stories. Now, for some of us, it's a little simpler than that, yet just as beautiful. Convicted in our hearts that we were sinners, that we wanted Jesus to save us. That's my story. It's not real crazy. I grew up in a Christian home, and around age 12, I had this overwhelming sense of my sin, my shame, my guilt. Can't remember the exact day, folks. I can't remember the exact year it happened, but I do remember the event. I went to my brother, my dad, and they led me to Christ. I repented of my sin. I turned away from the old. I embraced the new, and I've been forever changed. I was converted. God grabbed my heart, and he said, Luke, you are mine, and I've never been the same since. That's my story. How about you? Do you tonight have a conversion story? That's the burning question we wanna to answer today. Do you have a conversion story? See, if you are a Christian, you will have a story of conversion. You don't need to know the day, you don't need to know the time, but you do need to know that you've been born again by God, by the spirit of God, that you've been saved, forgiven, and transferred into the kingdom of his dear son. You need to know that. And if you don't have a story of conversion, you may not be converted. I was speaking to a group of middle school students this week and uh, talking about this thing of conversion. For a lot of people, it's, uh, they really had the hell scared out of them. And I don't know if that happened to you or not. I remember as a kid sitting in church and there's, you know, the preachers up there preaching against hell and, and uh, I didn't want to go to hell. And for a lot of people, quite frankly, there's like this line in the sand and hell's over there. And I apologize to you people up here in the front. You might want to pull your feet back, but hell's here, heaven's up there. And for a lot of people, this line in the sand, as long as I don't cross that, I don't go to hell. And a lot of people, they back away from hell going, I want to go to heaven. And they back into heaven. And that's kind of a crazy way to get to heaven, folks. And all they've got is their fire insurance. They've just had the hell scared out of them. They really haven't been converted you know what the gospel says in Matthew 13, 44? The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went home and sold all that he had to invest in that field. 
Jesus is saying that's what conversion is. It's not going, I don't want to go to hell. It's turning from hell and embracing a treasure and going, I want to know this treasure. I want to become more like him. I want to know him, moving closer and closer and closer to that treasure. That is true conversion. Not just being scared, but finding something, discovering. We have a lot of people who are relieved Christians. I'm so glad I don't have to go there but they've never discovered the treasure. They're not pursuing. Conversion is a change in direction. It's a change of, toward discovery instead of escaping. Conversion. Do you have a story of conversion today? Maybe today is the day that you get your new story of conversion. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus died for you and I. He took away all our sins on the cross and he wants to make us his very own. We can be converted today. Today is the day. And while Saul's conversion may seem really dramatic to some of us, there are similarities that his conversion has with every one of ours. And we wanna look at some of those lessons today. Number one, God wants you. That is powerful. You may have regrets. You may have a sordid past. You may have these highlight reels of shame in your past going through your mind right now. And I want to tell you, God saw it all. He saw everything firsthand, your greatest, your dirtiest, your most disgusting and disappointing moments. They were all done in the presence of God. And even more than that, they were done as a rejection of God. Every one of us has been there. And yet God still wants us. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Paul says, I'm an example that no matter how bad your rap sheet, no matter how tainted your past, God made you and he wants you and he is crazy about you. It reminds me a little bit of my three kids and uh, all of them are amazing, but of course they're all a little nuts at time as well. But I mean, what would you expect with a mom like theirs. Just one quick story. Soon after we moved to Thailand, a a long time ago, we lived there for about 10 years, but we were at this local Thai church and uh, we barely knew the the language. We barely knew the people. And our uh, one kid was playing in the, the kids zone and decided to take off her diaper and distribute the contents among the toys. And you know, it's in those moments that you kind of go, ooh, How could that come from me? That has to be part of my child's, you know, DNA from their mom. But you don't. You scoop them up, you clean them up, and you hug them a little tighter because that kid is mine, and I'm proud of that kid. I love her. And I'll go for that little stinker every time. I'm claiming her as mine. Sure, my kids can drive me a little crazy, but guess what? They are mine They may be selfish, annoying, or immature at times, but I will never, ever give up on them. They are mine, they are amazing, and they are beautiful. And I will always see the potential in their lives. And yeah, I wanna correct some stuff. Yeah, there's some stuff we gotta work on, some negative habits, and they will eventually, hopefully, grow up and mature. But at the end of the day, I'm still crazy about my kids, and there's nothing they could do to stop my love for them. And know this yet, I'm an imperfect earthly father to my kids. Imagine how much more your perfect heavenly father loves you and wants you. And not only does he want you, but he's been pursuing you just like he pursued Saul. That's the God of our Bible. Despite the fact that Saul kept resisting God, right? Over and over again. Scripture records Saul's not exactly responding to God's ongoing invitation. And so in his case, it's a, it's a lightning bolt that gets a hold of him and arrests him. Well, back to our text. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is it hard for you to kick against the goads? Now, I just want to point out, folks, that's not goats, That's goads, all right? There's a difference. A goad was a long pole with a sharp spike on the end. And when an ox would stop uh, dragging the cart, it would just stop in the middle of the road, the farmer would poke it with the goad. And often that stubborn ox would kick back against the goad, further injuring itself. 
So Saul, Saul had all these goads throughout his life, poking him, moving him toward repentance, and yet he kept resisting them. Maybe it was the sermon of Stephen that was one of those first goads where God was trying to get a hold of his life. It could have been seeing the confidence of the believers that he was imprisoning. Or maybe it was the scriptures that he studied as a, as a young boy, pointing to the Messiah, how Jesus fulfilled those, and yet he kept resisting those. I really don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us what his goads were, but Jesus is asking, Saul, does it hurt kicking against my prodding? A while back, a friend of mine was meeting with a guy at a coffee shop. He had all these questions about God. And this guy said, I just don't get the miracles, how they could happen. And I don't get all the suffering in the world. And this thing of hell, I just don't get it. But then with tears in his eyes, he says, but the thing I can't shake, why do I care so much? It's the goads, folks. It's God's mercy. It's the pursuit of God for you and me. Jesus pursues us way before we ever pursue him. And we need to stop ignoring those goads. It's his mercy. Here's another similarity between Saul's story and ours. God wants us to be dependent on him. Saul, who is top of his class, he's a valedictorian. He's a Bible scholar, a religious rule follower to the T. Yet he's heading to hell because he was dependent on his own strength, his own wisdom for his salvation rather than on Jesus. And God brought Saul to his knees. He led him around blind for three days in order to teach him that he has to be dependent on Jesus for everything. See, a lot of us, we want to do our own thing. We want to win our way into heaven. We don't want to be dependent on Jesus for everything. I've had two major surgeries in my life, and there's nothing like feeling completely immobilized. You, some of you know what I'm talking about. You need help to get dressed. You need help to get bathed. You need help to go to the bathroom. And I'm not even old yet, right? And I know some of you would, might dispute that, but I hated it, right? I hate being dependent on others. I want to take care of myself. I can handle this, right? Thank you very much. And I know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a guy thing. Uh, some of you guys might be able to relate. We wander around for a while because we won't ask directions, right? I hear you. But it's one reason why Christianity is so radical because you can't save yourself. Doesn't matter how many good things you do in the end, your good deeds don't hold a candle to Jesus. You don't need to just be good. You need Jesus for everything, everything. All right, moving on. From here on out, Saul goes by his Greek name, Paul, which is kind of interesting. And uh, some think it's because he was witnessing to the Gentiles most of the time, so that's why he would go by his Greek name. But I think he goes by the name Paul for another reason. See, the name Paul means small or little. The Saul who used to feel big, you know, accomplished with all his, his credentials, now he feels small compared to Christ. Now he's humble, dependent Saul. Paul is what he wants to be called. And when you first read this story, it's a little strange also how Saul is sent on this mission to Ananias. Like, why? Why would God have him go to see this guy named Ananias? Wasn't he humbled already? He's down on the ground. He's lost his sight. Shouldn't he just say a prayer in his heart and bam, right? Accept Jesus as Savior and his vision's restored. Why go to Ananias? Because the third similarity we see in Saul's conversion that should also be present in ours is simply this. God wants you in community. He wants us in community. See, God sent Saul to Ananias because he wanted him to get into the community that he was persecuting. When you get converted, you don't just enter into a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. You get converted into a community. That's why you never find a story in the Bible of one single Christian <laughs> who wasn't actively involved in a local body of believers, who wasn't involved in church. This is how we grow and develop. Yes, the Holy Spirit is the agent of change, but the way he changes us is through our community by introducing us to others. It's one reason why here at the bridge, we push you so hard to get involved in a small group. And you all know this. Think about your old life before you were converted. A huge reason the way you were back then is because of who you were around. Your old self comes from your old community. You are who you hang out with. Your new self comes from your new community. And I think that's why God made baptism a communal thing as well, because baptism forces you into community. You really can't baptize yourself. I mean, 
Maybe you can pray a prayer in your heart and Jesus save me and then jump in your bathtub and say, I baptize myself in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But I think that's just kind of a glorified bath. Baptism requires us to get into community. Now, one other quick point that we can't leave out is that God sent Ananias to go to Saul, the now Christian ex-terrorist, and welcome him into the family. See, as God's family, we are messy people and we're going to welcome in other messy people. Just like Ananias, we're gonna put our arms around anyone, anyone around here that says, I wanna follow Jesus. We're gonna say to you, brother, sister, welcome to the family because we are about the community. And then lastly, maybe you've never seen a bright light from heaven. Maybe you've never heard the audible voice of God. But if you've been converted, you know this is true of your story, that God wants to use you. God wants to use you. This is how good God is. He doesn't just save us from hell. He uses us for heaven. It's not just being saved from hell. It's being saved for heaven, being saved for a purpose. He fills us with new meaning. He takes the old, crummy, selfish, old, the broken parts of our lives, and he redeems them. And Saul's a great example of this. I mean, look at the list one more time that we talked about when we met Saul. What does God do? He redeems his privileged status. In the past, Saul used to use his high privilege to walk freely around the Roman Empire, locking Christians up. And now God says, Paul, I'm gonna take your Roman status and you can walk freely anywhere in the empire, not shutting churches down, but opening new churches up. I mean, how cool is that? And then secondly, God redeemed his brilliant and religious mind. Saul had biblical knowledge, but it was incomplete because he was missing Jesus. And now he's filled with the Holy Spirit and God redeemed his brilliant mind. We know that that Paul actually went on to write about 13 of our our 27 books in the New Testament. And in in the book of Romans alone, he actually quotes the Old Testament like a hundred times. God used that that brilliant memory of, of, of Paul's to make our New Testament a large part of it. And then on top of all that, Paul's credentials allowed him to preach in synagogues all across the Roman Empire. Wherever he traveled, the gospel began to spread. Thirdly, God redeemed his singleness, his singleness. Paul wouldn't have been able to do what he, had, what he accomplished if he had had a family traveling with him. I mean, imagine this, hey, I'm Paul. I'm gonna travel all the time and uh, start riots, have rocks thrown at me. I'm gonna be shipwrecked multiple times. I'm gonna be flogged, all with my wife and kids. It just wouldn't have been very practical for him. And at one point, Paul actually told the Corinthians, he said, a married guy has some responsibilities as a single guy doesn't have. God redeemed his singleness. And I know some of us here tonight, we might be single and we might be wondering, is is God punishing me? Is he's keeping me single? Is God withholding good from me? And I wanna tell you, no, absolutely not. God wants to redeem and use your singleness. He might have things for you to do in this season that you just couldn't do if you were married. I think of the two times that I was arrested in China, smuggling Bible, taking God's word in when I was young. And uh, you know, that was just what I was doing back there was not appropriate for a family. And then of course, I met Amy, we got married, and God has blessed us in our marriage as well. But if you're in a season of singleness, let God redeem that. Let him use you in this moment of singleness. And then fourthly, God redeemed Saul's resilient nature. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says that he was beaten with rods, stone, shipwrecked, adrift at sea, robbed, bitten by snakes. He went nights without sleeping days without food. He faced danger in just about every city that he went to. And that very same resilient spirit that would do whatever it takes to get rid of followers of Jesus would now be redeemed to do whatever it takes to make followers of Jesus. Some of those things that Paul was most ashamed of, God took and said, I can work with that. Reminds me, folks, of somebody from one of our campuses here at the bridge. This is an amazing story. How many of you listen to the Two Dudes in a, in a Canoe podcast? If, if you don't, you gotta, you gotta sign up for that. It's done by Pastors Junior and Jordan here at the bridge. And it's an amazing podcast. I, I listen to every episode that comes out. 
If you've listened to it this week, you've already heard this amazing story. And uh, it's about an ex-adult film actress and former Playboy model. She's got a history of sexual abuse and assault. And eventually she came to a point in her life where she said, if guys keep trying to take my body, I might as well just give it away. She had a very warped and sinful view of sexuality. But when she met Jesus, when she was converted, everything changed for her. Jesus healed her. He redeemed her. She was converted. And now she's a sex addiction and trauma therapist. Don't you love that? Don't you love what God can do? That's who he is. He's a redeemer. He converts, he heals, and he changes us into world changers. Redeem means to buy back, and that's what Jesus did for us. He bought us back. He bought you, he bought me, not with silver or gold, but with his own precious blood on the cross. He took our regret, he took our shame. And in spite of all that we've done and all that we were, in spite of all the train wrecks that we have caused in our past, he covered it because the cross covers it all. He wants us, he desires you and me. He says, I want you to be mine so much so that I'm willing to give my life for you. And as you become dependent on me, as you get into community, and as you go where I send you, you're gonna accomplish things that'll, that'll completely blow your mind that you can't even imagine in this moment when you get converted. And so that brings us to our so what tonight. I wanna ask you again, have you been converted? Have you been converted? I want you to close your eyes, consider these questions. Do you have a story tonight? If so, is there evidence of your conversion? Are you in community? Are you serving? Do you know the moment when Jesus came in and changed everything for you? We're gonna have prayer counselors down here at the front after we dismiss. If you don't have a conversion story tonight, I wanna invite you down here to meet with them. And let them help you write a new story tonight. You can be converted starting today. We invite you. Father, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you that you show up and you take the craziness of our story and our past and you change it. You convert us into something new. And Father, tonight I pray that that would be the experience of some folks here tonight who are not sure or have never experienced conversion. Give them courage, Lord, to step out of their seat, to walk down to the front, to share their story and to put their hand in your hand, to turn away from their sin, to repent and to be converted and to have a new life in you. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're gonna sing one more song. If you would please stand. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing, come on, better than you. Oh, there's nothing. We sang it earlier, come on. Nothing is better than you. Yeah. This is what our God does. We're going to sing it out. You turn morning to day.
We all got a story. Let's sing it out. Nothing is better than you. He's turning graves into gardens. Here we go. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the great message on conversion and God's heart for us. If this is your first time, we're so glad that you're here. We have a gift for you out in the lobby at our welcome desk. Make sure you go and pick that up. It's crazy, but Easter is in two weeks, and we have a few things for you. As you're leaving the auditorium, you're going to be handed an invite card to our Easter services. Now, we want every single person here to invite one person this week. So whether it's a family member, a co-worker, a friend, think about somebody that you could invite. Let's say you already invited somebody, and regardless if they said yes or no, invite one more person. Also, we're handing out our yard signs in the lobby, so if you didn't get a chance to grab a yard sign, make sure you go and grab one. They work, they look great, and we love seeing them in our community. And lastly, we hope everybody here goes to both our Easter services and our Good Friday service. We can't celebrate the resurrection without the death. So we can't celebrate Easter without celebrating Good Friday. It's going to be a great service. There's gonna be a clear gospel presentation. So invite your friends, invite your family members, invite your coworkers. It's going to be great and we hope to see you there. I'm gonna invite our prayer counselors up. Now these men and women would love to be praying for you. If you have a prayer request, a question about the faith, they are a great place to start. Thanks for joining us and remember to keep on inviting friends every week. It's one more, it's always one more. Meet the person next to you and have a great week.